Korean diplomat has been invited to New York for talks on how to revive stalled negotiations on its controversial nuclear program. Well, some media suggest he's already on his way to the U.S. Now, the move comes just days after top nuclear envoys from North and South Korea got together for the first time in over two years. That's during a security summit in Indonesia. There, they agreed to return to six-party talks as soon as possible. Negotiations broke down after North Korea's deadly shelling of an island belonging to the South in what it claimed was in response to provocative military drills. The U.S. says North Korea must dismantle its nuclear facilities before any deal can be reached. Well, with us now, Eric Weingartner, who's visited North Korea as a consultant on international humanitarian affairs. Thank you very much for being on the program with us. Now, uh, will North Korea's visit to the U.S. be enough to convince the country to return to the negotiation table? By itself, I doubt very much that it will uh, be convinced. Uh, North Korea has wanted to get back into direct negotiations with uh, the U.S. for quite some time. And uh, so they will definitely see this as a very positive uh, signal from the Obama administration, which uh, up until now has uh, uh, practiced what they call the uh, strategic patience. In other words, mainly ignoring North Korea in terms of direct involvement in, um, uh, in, in talks. So this is a first step, but um, the U.S. has also uh, outlined uh, numerous steps that North Korea will have to take before they will actually agree to restart uh, and get back into the six-party talks. All right. Well, uh, yeah, they're giving them a quite a number of conditions, right? Well, South Korea and the U.S. Uh, are also planning uh, joint military drills in disputed seas next month, which, as we have seen in the past, the North always finds provocative. So why do you think the South and the U.S. just keep on? Well, uh, one of the difficulties that, uh, that both U.S. and South Korea will face in the next year is that elections are coming. Um, it, it will not be very uh, helpful in either of the, uh, the countries if there was a renewed uh, uh, military incident uh, with North Korea. Uh, we've also heard this week that uh, North Korea is planning a rather major um, uh, military exercise on the western uh, seashore, which is uh, exactly the place where all of these incidents have happened before. So the situation is becoming rather serious in terms of uh, military confrontation, and it would help, obviously, if there were some talks uh, in process, because usually when North Korea is involved in positive talks, uh, either with the USA or with South Korea or indeed with, uh, in the six-party talks, uh, the provocations uh, have not happened. So I think there is a, a, an energy that is building up in all of these countries. Mr. Uh, despite, to uh, sorry to interrupt you, but despite the talks, and you were saying earlier that even the, nor the North was actually willing to talk to the U.S., but uh, from the perspective of the West, North Korea is often cited as a threat and, and as used as a reason that it needs comprehensive missile defense. So how much of a threat really is the country's nuclear capability? Personally, I don't think it is a threat in the sense that North Korea will use it uh, to attack uh, South Korea or Japan or any other country. Uh, for North Koreans, this is, uh, uh, this is very much a defensive uh, measure. They don't want to be attacked, and they believe rightly or wrongly, I think wrongly, but in any case, they believe that having nuclear weapons or even the threat of nuclear weapons uh, will safeguard them from attack. Okay, well, thank you very much for your insight there. Eric Weingartner, who's visited North Korea as a consultant on international humanitarian affairs.